Hey everybody, this is Anne. Welcome back. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. This is me, your host, and we do not have a disembodied voice, Justin, today. Just a cautionary uh, thing. If something happens with Kiwi's butt or with the other emergencies, um, I will have to leave you to your own devices, and uh, perhaps one of you will pop in, or perhaps Reaper John will pop in um, to uh, to ride herd uh, and keep you guys entertained. Whoa, 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 whoa! Minimize chat. Sorry, chat got huge. It was like you all got huge all of a sudden. Good morning. Oh, thank you for the sub, Ty. Okay, I, we're, we're definitely, I think at this point, we're definitely at our at our 100 subs. So I need to schedule an AMA, and we're probably going to need to schedule that for this Friday. So I'm going to put that down on my list so that I remember to touch base with Courtney, or have Justin touch base with Courtney, and uh, AMA figure, question mark, question mark, question mark. All right, so that I will remember to touch uh, touch base with the peeps to see what fun we might put together. Am I quiet again? Did it reset? Let me look. I'll check my tray. One second. Sound settings. Let's look. Man, device properties. No, no, it's okay. I mean, I can bump it a little bit more. We'll bump it a little bit more, but that's it. That's what I'll do. Um, Justin can't adjust on his end because he doesn't have a, a sound room at Reaper right now. So, yeah. Well, nice and loud. I don't know if it's nice. <laughs> I'm definitely loud. <laughs> All right. So, AMA. I'm going to put down Hypothetical Friday for the AMA. Fridays seem to work well for us because then we can promote for Reaper on Reaper Live the day before. Um, so I will put that down on my list to uh, to hit Justin with. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just looking at my other to-dos. All right. Sweet. So today, guys, today is is is, uh, is a fantastic day for me. Today is six months to the day since I moved here to California. So six months ago, on the night. David and I drove into Mountain View, and I assumed residency. So we are going out to a very, very, very nice restaurant. Nicer restaurant than we have been to ever together uh, tonight to celebrate. So that's, like, super happy. Yes, it's Happy California Day. Um, it's the me-aversary. <laughs> arrive aversary. <laughs> right, Kiri? We both arrived. Yes, after a very long road trip of three days. Yeah, from Texas. With a dog packed into a car, and she could barely fit with all the stuff. <laughs> It's been six months, I know, right? And I'm so happy with how everything is going. Like, as far as, as my stream, like this stream, and my personal private stream, and my Patreon, and my everything. Like, you guys have been fantastic. And, uh, and yes, I'm staying afloat. <laughs> I'm staying afloat. This is awesome. Um, so, yes, follow me on my freelance journey, my harrowing freelance journey. <laughs> but, yes, thanks to all of you. I am I'm doing great, including Reaper, because Reaper definitely contributes a lot to that. You know, I get I get a little bit of money for these streams and I get, you know, just general Reaper supply and happiness and and so Reaper also plays a very big part. So thank you, Reaper. All right. Uh yeah, Cornico. Yeah, it's the um it's the Michelin star, the only Michelin starred restaurant in Mountain View. Um and we've I've never been to a Michelin starred restaurant, so I'm like all excited. So um but yeah, it's got like nine courses, like, and they try to make little unique courses and it takes like two and a half hours to eat everything. Um, so like they space you out so you don't get overly full. And uh, yeah, it sounds really cool. And it's, it's an adventure. Like they don't put up a menu beforehand. You just have to submit your list of like food allergens or dietary restrictions. And then they just go. So this sounds really fun. And the chef just makes whatever they feel like. And I'm, so I'm very excited. I'm very excited. It could be, it could be some weird stuff on the menu. It could be, you know, and if I, if I remember, I should, I should remind myself to take pictures and post on the discord if there's anything really pretty. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is uh Shea TJ's I think is in, uh, Mount there's a couple of different Shea TJ's, but one is Michelin starred and, and that's the one we're going to. So yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Kind of like that. Pull it, uh, pull, Polaris art, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they take their um, inspiration from or if it's just the chef does what the chef does, you know, which is super cool. 
So yeah, so that's what we're going to do. So let's talk. We can stop talking food for two seconds and uh, go down to Alethea. And uh, we got so nice, uh, so much nice progress on her yesterday. And I did promise that we would do some more enemenemenemenemenems today. So uh, yeah, let's do some enemenemenemenemenems. Um, I'm going to put some of these colors back off of my plate, which are currently cluttering up everything. Thou shalt not clutter, paint. And uh, yeah, and my my now uh, super rare uh, bottle of um, swamp green. Get my troll hide out of the way. All right, let's just go back to basics. Cloudy gray, and remember, we also use our favorite color of um, sky reflection ashen blue. Hopefully, that's not canceled. Um, I didn't check. <laughs> if it, if I pick any color in this next from now on if i pick any color that you guys know is no longer available remind me because that's a long list and it's hard to remember them all yeah yeah hello twistoma hello everybody yes 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 and good morning yeah and as as stated justin is running this uh from his phone so he will not be able to be disembodied voice today he is uh without equipment uh so yeah so if something weird comes up i'm gonna rely on all you guys to you know, to jump in and keep everybody entertained for the, you know, five minutes or whatever it takes me to empty out a Kiri dog or whatever happens. So let's see. I think I was using, looking around for my, uh, what I want to use for a shadow. I think I was using gray liner, but I don't know where my gray liner went. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, carbon gray is a good choice. There, we're going to do that. So carbon gray is like an off black, right? It's it's actually, it is a charcoal gray, so it's not quite to black. Uh, and if we need a little extra dark, we can, you know, grab something that works. But I think this will actually, carbon gray will actually work pretty well. If carbon gray is canceled, let me know. If it is, I'll cry. We needed a charcoal gray for so long. Um, so like, yeah. Oh, thank you, Carrie Michael Cosby. Thank you. Already trying to get us back up toward our next AMA before I even can do this AMA. Um, but yeah, thank you for the resub with the prime. We appreciate it. We appreciate it very much, Lee. All right, so there's our colors for our or as they say, non-metallic metal. So those are what we are going to use today, and we'll see if we need something a little darker than carbon. But carbon, in reality, should be pretty good. Now, one thing to kind of remember also, guys, is that this does vary when you work on um, models that are very small. Uh, you usually want a little bit more punch on small models in your darks and light. So just like we do lining and we over-exaggerate highlights and everything when we work on a small model, because it is so tiny, we have to bring out those details. So even on NMM, you may have to punch your shadows a little darker. So we'll see if the carbon gray works. On a lot of bigger models, you might be able to get away with, with a slightly higher uh, shadow. Because sky reflection, Val. I did it on the sword here. Here, let me get this guy's out of here. And my favorite color for sky reflection is ashen blue. Because, I mean, there are some days where the sky is really, really bright. But it's usually not reflecting quite that bright. So if you look on the blade here. Let's get down. Let's get in focus. Let's get down. See? Blue. Not blue. That one. That's why blue. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm seeing no nothing on my side, uh, Twisted Oma. Nothing on my side. But yeah, so also up here on the breastplate, there's also some blue. It's hard to see because I went too high. But there's also some blue on the upper side of that. So again, Val, this comes back to thinking about what surfaces are going to be facing what direction and getting the brightest lights and the darkest shadows. So when you're, when you're doing something like out on the city square, like I'm doing with her, and you want to suggest a little bit of that sky color, you can, you know, bring that blue in. Now, actually, now that I'm thinking about that, one thing that I should do is to add a touch of yellow to my highlights on this teal. Because uh, just a touch, just like a little hint of warmth, because that will further sell the sunlight effect, if that's what I'm going for. If I'm, if I'm going for that sort of effect, that's what I need to do. Um... And it, it really depends, right? She's going to look great the way she is. But if I want a very realistic effect, I need to be consistent with all of my light sources and the color of them to carry that effect. So let's just get ourselves set up here. I'm going to make a big puddle of cloudy gray. 
probably about six, seven drops. I just kind of dump it into the palette at this point. I don't so much concern myself with the actual levels of my base coat. I just want it so I can spot mix it back into things and glaze with it. I'm gonna do it to about a three to one, just like I normally do everything. Three to one paint to water. And we'll mix that up. Oh, so it's Mocha Stream 2. See, that says to me it's Twitch. Oh, Reaper John, is that an update to the last list? And also, John, I might need you later since Justin's not able to ride herd if I need somebody to jump in on voice uh, if I have to take Kiri out for an emergency or something. Um, let me just open that real quick. And hopefully it'll pop open in another window. Okay, cool, John. Thanks. Oh, I clicked on the link, and I shouldn't have clicked on the link. Now my Twitch is very upset with me. Oh, well. We will ignore it. But, yeah, I'll try to, um, hold on. There we go. There we go. Uh, okay. All right, cool. Excellent. All right, so if extended inventory of certain colors. You guys reading this? So now is the time to get your redstone shadow and your peacock green, everybody. And your bright skin stuff. Um, looking at what else might be. And your dusky skin. And your sunset purple. And your graveyard bone and your spattered crimson. And don't forget Old West Rose because it's like the only decent like monster mouth pink left. Yeah. So go and get all of that stuff now. Sell it out. I'm going to put a reaper order in myself later today. Hold on, let me just close that. Yeah, it's a last call. It's a last call, looks like. Have they updated that list, or did they just, like, do a limited, like, run and it's already sold out? Oh, they get turned back on tonight at 6 p.m. Central. So, yes, quit, quit alarmisting. Be, be, <laughs> take a step back, everybody. They're not yet activated. They're going to get turned on tonight at 6. So everybody get on at 6.01. Um, and uh, crash the Reaper website. <laughs> yeah, Dragon Eye, it's not a bad idea. It's never a bad idea to have several bottles of something you use all the time. I mean, I even have several bottles. I mean, I have several bottles of, of pure white, several bottles of... Uh, you know, common loose colors. I've got several bottles of cloudy gray since I use it for NMM all the time. Yes, that's very good. Thank you, Reaper John, um, for giving everybody advance notice. I'm sure everybody really appreciates that. So now people can get their butts together today and plan. Nomad Zeke is always a little bit weird um, with those muted colors. Uh, I mean, there are some colors on that list that I know. I mean, Bright Skin has never been a, a top seller because people don't know how to use it. That's why I did the stream on it, right? Um, people don't understand that when you actually put it on the model, it looks a lot different than it looks in the model. So things like that I totally get. Um, but, I mean, muted colors in general. Like when I put out the terracottas, they did not do well. And Redstone does better than terracotta. But, you know, if I would have put Redstone out and named it Tiffling Skin... I bet everybody would buy it. <laughs> uh, so sometimes it's as, as weird as the naming. The name of the color can influence um, how well or how poorly it does. I'm going to thin down my uh, charcoal gray to, uh, or my carbon gray to uh, very low, like maybe almost a one-to-one. -one. Maybe it is about a two-to-one, actually. And I'm going to need it even thinner than that because it's going to be shadows. Yeah, whatever. Non-IP infringing name. But you get the idea, right? The point is. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense for Reaper to do it this way because now they can, like, capitalize, run through. If there is back stock, they can run through it. Otherwise, they can get, like, one gallon and then just sell it out. You know, so. This makes a lot more sense to me. 
I mean, if you've got stuff that you don't want on the shelf anymore, great. But give everybody a chance to order it. It's just a, it's a great Goodwill measure. I'm really glad that, that uh, Reaper decided to do that. You can all say thank you, Ed, on Reaper Live this week, okay? Say thank you, Ed, for giving us advance notice and making giving us a little more time to get some of our favorite colors before they go away. And try not to be piggy, you know, not try not to order five bottles of things because then fewer people get to take advantage of it. At least don't order five bottles right away. If there are still bottles available by Saturday or Sunday and you want to really, 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 you know, like have five bottles of your favorite color. Um, uh, jelly, I mean, it's up to you, but I think peacock green is really useful. I mean, uh, I mean... Anne's favorite colors out of this list. All right, here we go. Here we go. Somebody write it down because I'm not going to repeat myself because we're already disrupting our stream. So hold on. Anne's favorite colors on this list that she was very sad to see go. 9073, chestnut gold. 9142, stained ivory. That's a ridiculous cancellation in my opinion. 9175, swamp green. Looking, looking, looking. 9220 olive skin shadow although a lot of you may not realize it and that's probably not you probably don't need that one as much so but uh 9224 redstone and 9223 redstone shadow definitely 9226 pecan peacock green for sure 9232 bright skin shadow because it's a beautiful little pink color for skin tones to use as a blush color on any skin tone uh that's fair 9233 bright skin uh looking 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 for the rest i like 9249 sandy brown both for earth effects and as a base for a, a more tan skin tone the dusky skin triad is up to you i'm going to show you guys how to mix that color but 9251 50 and 52 dusky skin triad uh if you really like indigos do take a look at the violet light sunset purple and deep twilight triad I would say Graveyard Bone 9272 is one of my real reach fours because it's a neutral bone. Uh, it's Highlight 9273 is also a nice neutral off-white. 9277 is Battered Crimson. Yeah, it's up to you guys. That's I, It's a nice paint, but you could do much the same thing with the Dragon Red, probably. Uh, 9282 Maggot White as our only green off-white and ain't coming back anytime soon. 9283 Old West Rose is a color not just for dresses, but for or for roses, but also great, great color for inside of monster mouths, um, monster teeth, gums, tongues, etc. Or not teeth, sorry, gums and tongues, stuff like that. It's also a great blush color for skin tones. Mix a little bit in. Uh, the rest of these are not necessary. Like you could, you could get close with various other things. All right. That's all. That's the only thing I'm going to do. That's that's the only time I'm going to do that. Yeah, and like I said, Olive Skin Shadow, There, you could probably get away at a pinch with um, Rich Leather, although it's not quite the same. I like those skin tone shadows, like Bronzed Shadow and uh, Olive Skin. Like, I do a mix of Olive Skin Shadow and Bronze Shadow for some skin tones, like, and add white, like, because I like the way those interact, but like I said, your, your time may vary. Yeah, some of those, like I said, some of those are really, like, if I, if I had, you know, still been at Reaper, I would have seriously fought for uh, Peacock Green 9226 and Swamp Green 9175 and 9073 those out of all of these that and i use stained ivory all the time i mean stained ivory 9142 is straight out our best parchment and scroll color like just flat it's just the best one that's what i use it for non-stop yeah it's about 250 bottles to the gallon roughly Depends on how Audrey and Tiamat are working, or Audrey and Eldercar, or whatever Ed has managed to rename the other paint machine to in the time that I've been away. So usually we work in three gallon batches, guys, because that's how fast we flip paint, and we need to uh, 
do that. But these these colors, if they made more for you guys, they probably did in half a gallon or gallon. Um, so it'll probably go pretty quick. It's not very efficient to mix. Ah, uh, my white is just way too strong. Way too strong. Too strong white. Where is my white? Where is my water? Um, but yeah, there's a lot of colors. The thing is that it's just, it's a utility question. Um, a lot of the colors, those colors I named are very high utility colors. Uh, meaning that you can use them for a lot of things that they aren't, that aren't in their name, right? But a lot of people who don't paint might not realize that. Like when I look at a color, I don't look at the name at all. I look at the color and I ask myself what it's like and what I could use, you know, what kind of effect I could produce with it. You know, and sometimes I ask, what can I mix with this? But 9073 is just, the problem with 9073 being out of production is that I feel that it's just a superior version of 9030. Um, it's just going to blob on some white where I want it, and then I'm going to fix it. Uh, too much paint on my brush there. That was that was the problem there, but it's easy to fix. Just take some of your gray and feather in the edge. Um, but 9073 is more saturated. Like, there were a lot of colors in the original 54 that ended up just because either it was um, because Al was helping me mix them and we were and I didn't understand the value of saturated more saturated colors at the time like we were going for coverage and that meant we were adding a lot of white here and there to certain colors and that bleached them out a little bit but it did give them better coverage um, but then when it came down to making my next set I really wanted a more vibrant tan than that one that was more useful for mixing that had a lot less white in it and no black. And so that's how chestnut gold was made. So it is really true that chestnut gold is kind of the better version of 9030. Um, that was always my kind of, that was in my mind when I was making it. Because after um, Al was no longer helping me and I'd had time to kind of develop my chops as a, as a paint mixer and creator, and also and I'd had time to use the paints, you know, that we had first created, there were a lot of changes that I would have made had I known more when I started, you know, you always do that, right? When you're new to a thing and you do a thing and then you're like, man, if I would have known this when I started, I would have done this so different. And that's true. So really chestnut gold is the color that leather brown would have been if I had been experienced in making a paint line before. I need to figure out what I'm going to do with these little fasteners on her, uh, on her boots, the side of her boots. She's got fasteners over here. And I just kind of left them, um, and she's got fasteners on the other side. I thought about at first about making them gold. I'm not sure. I might just go for a steel on those little little fasteners on the side of her boots. Um, uh, Winter's Day, it was done yesterday. We had to mix the heck out of it because uh, my original color got canceled. So Swamp Green being killed, I could not mix my teal the way I wanted to. Um, so I had to mix my teal uh, an entirely new way. And I believe that in the end it was mostly Tianzia Jade with a touch of, it was a mixture of these three colors, plus maybe a little white for highlights. And uh, I think it was 3-3-1-2, three, three, but don't quote me on that. Cyan is very strong, be warned. Um, but it was, it was something like that. Tune to, adjust to your taste. How about that? Do those and adjust to taste. It's like cooking. Some of us like more black pepper, some don't. All right, let's see here. So notice how even though I blorfed on that first layer of white, I managed to just bring in my gray and nicely fade it out. I am working with very thin paint right now. Um, not so much with the blue, though I will add more, a bit more water to the blue because I want to be able to glaze that in. But I want it to be strong enough so I see the color if I'm going to use it on sky areas. I think he's saying he uses Paint Rack, the actual Paint Rack app. But I could be wrong. All right, so you can see how thin my, my um, cloudy is. It just kind of fell off the side of the palette. So it's really... You guys know how thin I work with my color, you know, like that. So this way it has enough where if I paint it over the edge of something, it is going to cover a little bit. 
but it's not going to be real strong. So it's not quite layering consistency. It's a little stronger than that because I'm wet blending, so I want a little bit best. Um, liquid paint rack is the actual name of the app. That's what I thought. I persist in not getting paint, paint uh, organizational apps because I keep telling myself I don't have a problem. <laughs> also, I just forget to use the app. <laughs> uh, I just organize it by having it in a box at my feet or a drawer or, or a secondary box on my shelf in the case of the Scale 75s that I've been using. There's plenty of apps out there. I mean, do what you, uh, you know, find find the one that works for you is really the name of the game there. All right. I am, and I'm super happy that our hobby has uh, has enough devotees that, you know, it, it uh, warrants having its own apps. All right, so blocking in some shadow here. Remember, you need that shadow next to your bright highlight. I may actually have gone a little bit too far inland here, so I'm going to actually extend my shadow closer to the highlight, and I also need to bring that highlight up. Notice how, and this is actually a really good example, guys. So notice how over here it looks shinier, and over here it's much softer. This doesn't really look like metal yet. I'm putting my highlights in, but I don't have, what do I? What am I missing? I'm missing that really bright and really dark, right? So if you try to do NMM like this, real timid, and you don't get real dark with your shadows, and you don't do like straight up to pure white with your highlight, you will not, it won't look like it. It'll just kind of look like a satin kind of uh, effect. It's not going to look like real metal. So troubleshooting NMM. First bottle of MFSP paint, I actually finished using it to paint. I would think it was a bottle of brown liner Polaris. Pretty sure it was. I used brown liner like crazy. Now I use a whole bunch of different things to line, depending on the model. But, uh, yeah, my white is still really strong. Pure white. Pure white is the strongest of the strong paints. So I'm having to bring in my, uh, bring in my, uh, cloudy. I'm not certain, Jetta. Um, you may be able to find them on like uh, Chinese calligraphy sites because often they're called um, porcelain ink trays. So you could try that search term. I don't know about the 28 well one though because I'm not sure where Cheap Joe's gets them. I'm not sure um, what company actually makes that. Hmm. All right. I need to thin my white more. So my white is just like falling off the side of my palette, but this is not thin enough. It may look like water, but it's not thin enough, guys. It's not. So plop some over into another palette well. A lot of people I see um, on the Patreon are just not using the paint thin enough, or if they are using the paint thin enough, they are not uh, utilizing the control of just loading a tiny bit on their brush. When you're working with paint that's this puddly, guys, you cannot just do this. You can't. You're going to spend all day unloading what you just loaded. So instead, rinse off your brush and mostly dry it off because you really don't need extra fluid in the bristles for this because this is wet paint. And just hit the tip. Like, see that? About a third up. That's it. And then unload. And it won't take you nearly as long to unload to the point where you can go and make a nice flat line with no no puddling. You can do tiny little detail, tiny, tiny detail lines. Tiny, see? Tiny, tiny. The type of detail lines that you need to like do hair strands and, you know, like dots on eyeballs and stuff, you know, like seriously. Amazon UK. Ceramic watercolor palette on Amazon UK. Thanks, Chibi. Chibi, you're so helpful. White is a pain until you use Reaper Pure White. Then it is no longer a pain. You simply need to learn to thin it. And then to unload your brush. Unload, unload, and I'll test it on my fingernail if I need to, but I usually can tell just by the way the paint is unloading whether I have control or not. And then what I can do is be a lot more 
subtle of my stuff. You're just avoiding work. But yeah, I mean, trying to layer up with white, the thing is it takes patience and very thin paint. And if I go too far, I have to do kind of a little mix of my white and my um, cloudy gray and come back at the edge and just feather it in. Um, so, I mean, it's just control. You and the paint are having a little tiff and you are just trying to make it do what you want it to do. And really, with white, it really is that people just don't thin it enough. They just don't. They don't realize it has to be water. Because pure white is, like, made to be able to do that. And to be fair, a lot of paints can't do this. Like, a lot of white paint on the market, I would dare say almost any white paint on the market. Although I would have to, like, put the modern uh, equivalents through their paces again. Because I did this long ago. And things do change. Um, but almost any white paint on the market, I believe, cannot be thinned to this level. The base will simply prohibit it. Um, only MSP. So this is a great highlight and all, guys, but it's not an MM because we're missing our dark shadows. Um, and also my white actually isn't light enough yet. So I'm actually going to layer up a little bit of excess down the middle of this leg. Then we're going to play with our shadows. And I want to make sure to have some cloudy gray as a transition. Now, the more gray you've got as a transition between your white and your shadow color, the more um, soft, like burnished finish, not shine, not super shiny, um, the less shiny your finish is going to look, the less sharp. No, Iggy. This paint is made to not do this. Two things. Flow Improver is added to all Reaper Master Series paint so that it, the paint does not break unless you seriously get it down to glaze level. This is not glaze level. Ideal white layering level for MSP Pure White is 2.5 drops of water to one drop of paint. So it may look terrible. It may look like it would do it. But this is, this is you're using this to highlight with, right? You're not using this to, like, base coat with. You just want a nice blend. And so for doing this sort of small work... Like, I can get this very, very smooth. And honestly, if I see any streakies, I'm going to actually thin it more, not less. But, yeah, this is a little bit too, I think it's a little bit uh, not quite thin enough, actually. But Reaper Pure White is able to be thinned 2.5, 2.5 drops of water. So five drops of water to two drops of paint, which is crazy. And it will stay good. It'll, it'll work as a layering uh, at that point. Pure white. Reaper pure white, Iggy, is the best white on the planet. I will continue to say that and challenge anybody to prove me wrong. The only time is if you need it super thick and super, like, you know, you, for some reason you're doing a thick paint layered up, like, palette knife application. Okay, then it's not. But if you're doing miniature painting and you need a white that can layer, that's your baby. That's it. There is no better white. I created this directly because of a need in the marketplace. When I was painting in the early aughts, late 90s, early aughts, um, a lot of my, you know, we were first experimenting with smooth blends a lot, me and my friends. And the big fail was getting a white that you could thin down and layer up smoothly that wouldn't break, that wouldn't separate, right? Because you could do it with Vallejo, but you, the paint was constantly separating. So it was just a pain. Um, and then when you sealed it, you usually lost a lot of your highlights. Um, so when I made Master Series, the first thing I wanted to do was to find a base that would enable me to create a white that could be thinned down to this level and not break. That would be functional and that would not separate. All right. High praise, Kroniko. Thank you. It's good to know that you hit the target you're aiming for. But, like, I, I need to order probably another six bottles just because, you know, now I'm mixing it with tube paint. Like, now I'm like, hmm, I, I am using this tube paint as an experiment. But you know what? I'm still going to use Reaper Pure White because no other white is good. 
Shadows. It's shadow time. All right, let's see here. Probably want to build our shadow kind of like up here where I kind of built the shadow coming down from the shadow on this overhang. I'm going to build the shadow coming down on this other side too. So I'm going to take this dark shadow up here and I'm going to carry it down the leg using little dashes. Now I'm going to build that up. Ah, oh, Twitch. Twitch forgetting to tell people I'm on. Come on, Twitch. I thought we were friends. And I've been railing about how pure white is the best white on the planet. You missed it, Trixie. But you've already heard that probably, so, you know. But yeah, every time I try a white from another paint line, I'm just like, throw my hands in the air and just throw it on the, <laughs> throw it in the garbage. <laughs> I don't even try anymore. If I'm going to be really honest, 100% honest, I don't even try. I, I didn't, like, I'm sitting here experimenting with Scale 75's tube paint on my personal stream. And I never even bothered to order the white. Like, it's over on David's table. He's got it. He picked a whole bunch of, you know, he picked a custom set when he uh, did their Kickstarter. Um, and he ordered white. And I just didn't. Because I knew. I knew it wouldn't be as good. And so I didn't even go there. So the carbon may not be quite as dark as I need. I'm going to actually get a little bit of brown liner. Where's my brown liner? I don't want to use pure black because it's really strong. I don't want to use walnut. You really want a paint that's going to thin for you. There's brown liner. Yeah, I haven't gotten back into oils yet. I'm actually enjoying... Um, right now, my experimental uh, invader is uh, is the, uh, the, the scale color. Um, I can use... Uh, I explained this a little bit, but... Um, they have they just have access to a couple of different pigments that I never had access to, so I like to play with them and just expand my knowledge of how different pigments act in the paint world in case I ever have to, you know, in case Reaper calls me in to make a new paint line and we've got access to new materials and all that. I want to be familiar um, with a lot of the classic pigments and kind of how today's variants of them work because all, pigments are really changing, right? A lot of paint companies, a lot of traditional paint companies like Grumbacher and Winsor Newton and, you know, all those other big ones um, and Liquitex are going away from a lot of the traditional pigments like cadmium and, well, cadmium because it's toxic, but some other pigments too that are just really expensive like cobalt, um, you know, and, and try finding a real ultramarine that's not made with uh, thalocyanine red. You know, it's like they're, they're sliding toward using more synthetic organic pigments um, and also trying to using the high high density pigments that we use in Master Series. Actually, um, a lot of those companies are using high density reds and yellows now to simulate, essentially, to make a non cadmium cadmium. So we started; they got there later. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so right now, since I'm testing out those uh, those Scale seventy five tube paints, I'm not really in the mind zone to to throw another uh, curveball at myself for trying oils. Although every time I watch Wapple, um, I think about it. I do have a bust that would probably be really good for it. So I was joking about trying it on stream and failing in front of you all because it's been a long time since I did oils. I haven't done, I used to love oils in college. So I'm using a real thin down brown liner here now, guys, just kind of with my, um, my carbon, carbon gray, just to get a little bit of extra dark. And if it gets a little too dark, I can take, this is why I'm keeping my cloudy gray open. I can kind of fudge the boundary here. And sometimes when you're doing a cylinder like this and you're trying to get it to blend, um, you just have to go back and forth a little bit just to get it to work. Ah, that's too much, too much paint. Did you see how that puddled? Too much paint on your brush. Did not unload, got impatient. When you're working with really thin paint, it's really easy to do that, to get impatient, to just grab some paint and go for it and not realize that if you do that, you are going to fail and then you're going to grouse it yourself because then you have to repaint it a oh, little bit too much gray and a lot of this yeah when you're trying to do smooth uh smooth cylinder type stuff it can get really really fidgy yep that's like kind of a feel that's that's kind of traditional Payne's gray um, Payne's Gray, uh, originally was not made, um, with, uh, what was it made with? It was made with ultramarine and a red and an ochre was original. That was the original mix. But now, um, especially if the, 
burnt sienna that you're using is mixed with yellow oxide and red oxide, you're essentially doing the same thing. Because the modern, like that actually plays exactly to what I was saying about the modern equivalent of those colors is like the modern equivalents of those colors are not built with the traditional, they don't use burnt sienna anymore in most uh, paints, like generally available, decently priced paints. Um, it's just too bloody expensive to use some of that stuff now. Yeah, ex ex that is exactly true, Invader, which is why I've been talking an awful lot about brush loading and unloading. Um, was just thinking about putting up a public video on the Patreon about it. Might just do the $2 video, but I don't know. I think that some videos where I feel like the public really needs to know, I just make it free. It's like, and nobody talks about this stuff. I mean, I am constantly on my streams, but... There's a lot of stuff, and this is true in writing and painting. You could have a very good writer or a very good painter, but not a lot of those people know how to explain what they do. Like, they do it, but they don't think a lot about how or why they do it. And I've run into this with some of my very, very good painting friends, you know, but then they never took the extra step to find out why. So with me, I've always taken the extra step to find out why. And being the paint developer for Reaper just pretty much played into that because then there was an extra reason to find out the why. Because it essentially made me better able to communicate with my, um, my paint suppliers when I was looking for a new product, right? And uh, so that and I've always been the person who wants to, I always want to kind of remove the mysteries for you guys. Like I have always been the type to say, okay, how can I explain this to somebody? How can I explain color theory to somebody who's never been to art school and has no art background, right? How can I break that down to make it understandable for somebody and not intimidating and fun and, you know, empowering? So for me, brush loading and unloading is kind of that same thing where it's something a lot of people don't talk about, or if they do talk about it, I don't know like how like effectively they talk about it. Um, so I'm just trying to make it a thing for you guys that makes sense. I'm still not, I'm still not super happy with that. I'm gonna bring up a highlight. Yeah, that's because they're compliments, Valandar. Pretty much golden blonde is mostly white, nightshade purple is mostly black. Then you mix the purple and the blonde and they're complementary, so they make a gray. They make a neutral. They're going to make a brown or make a gray, depending on how much yellow. If golden blonde had more yellow in it, they would make a gray brown. And if, uh, if it didn't, then they make a gray. Slightly warmish gray. But yeah, that's why it works. You are late, but here, Shadow Raven. It's good. It's good. We're without a Justin today. We're flying with no Justin. Uh, he is... At Reaper, but of course the studio is still in pieces, so he does not have the capability. And if a dog emergency happens, it will be John helping us out, keeping you guys entertained while I rush the little doglet outside. But so far the doglet is doing okay, but you know, you never know. She's been having just bad butt days lately. Kiri has like weeks where she's really good and then, you know, absolute disaster will strike. I'm going to, I'm trying to troubleshoot now. I want a little bit more light here coming in on the side I don't want too much dark I want to be able to see that light see I want that stripe I want that light dark light and then mostly this interior leg isn't going to be reflecting as much light so you can see here I've just got a little bit I didn't bring it up very much I just brought it up a little bit I'm gonna do the same thing here now the thing about using white this thin is that in order to get a, a pure white, a real true white uh, layered up, you have to put several layers on. And this is actually good because when you want less of a highlight, you can have it by just putting a, a single layer of white on. Here I actually got a little bit too light. I'm going to come in with my gray. NMM is the most back and forth because uh, you need it to look right. It absolutely just needs to visually look correct. And so if you don't have that correctness, you have to troubleshoot until you get it. And for me, I'm just shifting kind of the shadow here a little bit more in inland. That's looking good. Hey, Achilles, thanks. Right, exactly, Valander. 
that's what I, that's what I was saying. Bla uh, Nightshade Purple is built in a black black base, and uh, um, Golden Blonde is built in a white. So they're as you say, one is as dark as the other is light. They cancel each other out, and then the yellow and purple interact to make it warmer. Normally, you mix yellow and purple, you're going to get a brownish color. So that's why you get the warmth. I'm going to go a little stronger with my white here. When you've got your blend set up, you can sometimes get away with a really spot highlight going down the middle, especially if you want real shiny. I want a little bit of shadow there and a little bit of highlight. And then this this sword blade. Let's let's rock this sword blade. So I'm gonna just paint over the entire top surface with this um, ash and blue. Because facing the light is facing the sky even more than this one is. So I'm gonna go with the blue. And it's it's thinned, so it's not gonna like be screaming blue. It's thinned over the gray. So see, but you can see blue and gray. Now, edging. This is why I kept some of my white a little stronger because I knew I was going to need it for this. Whenever you're doing NMM on an angled sword blade, do a white uh, highlight down the middle and on both sides. Um, if you want, you could do side brush. You can put white on your brush and then run it down the side. That's the easiest way to probably do it, although it can get globby if the sculpt is not really tight. So test it. But you want this. You want that white edge then you want this white edge too because um, under reflections and you may at this point it intersects with her uh, ankle so I have to paint that line on so I paint the top line on same way Um, invade, uh, invader, here you go. I, I actually went over this on yesterday's show. It takes all of three minutes. Doesn't really need a long form video. So, I mean, what you want, and it really depends on the thinness of your paint, but the thinner your paint is, the more watery your paint is, the less you want to dip your brush into the mix. So if I'm working with a thicker white, I might dip my paint, my brush, like almost halfway in. And then I'm just going to unload it until I can no longer see puddles. Puddles, see? Now the problem you're going to run into, I think the reason a lot of people don't talk about this invader is that a lot of them aren't using wall palettes like me. A lot of them are using wet palettes, which means that every brush stroke they do is not going to be exact. Um, it's just, you know, you can get close and you can get to the point where, oh yeah, if I run my brush lightly over the wet palette paper, uh, it gets to more or less what I want. But that's hard to explain to somebody in a way they can troubleshoot. Whereas if you have a well palette, you can say when you stop seeing puddles, when you can draw a thin line on your fingertip, that's where you that's where you are, right? And then if you are working with thinner paint, you want to dip only the tiny tip in. Maybe only get oh, I need to mix that up. That is so thin. There we go. If you leave it long enough, it will eventually separate out a little bit, but it takes a while. So then you're getting to what I showed before, where it's only like about a quarter up the brush. And you're unloading it again, dabbing it on the side of the palette until you see your brush come to a perfect point. You can draw little tiny, really thin lines with it without pooling. You don't mind if the end of your stroke is a little stronger. That's natural. When you pick up your brush, you're going to get a higher stroke. But that's what you want for layering. So that's actually, you know, working as intended. And you can continue to layer that up to get a blend. See the blend? Fade. You want that fade. Um, so, I mean... If you're working on a wet palette, then you're just going to be working kind of at a handicap if you're trying to kind of learn intrinsically what paint consistency is. I think I always recommend that people pick up both because you work with the well palette and get a sense of how the paint looks and acts and when it's right at the consistency you want and how much you want on your brush and how much you don't want. And then switch to the wet palette when you've got some of that internalized and you understand it a little bit better and you'll get more mileage out of your wet palette. Um, it also depends if you're using te doing textures and you're not doing smooth blends, then you don't 
you know, you don't need to worry. Maybe you don't need to worry about your pink, pink consistency as much. My boyfriend, David, does amazing work. Never does the smooth blending. Like it has never, doesn't do as a well palette, has never mastered super smooth blending. And he paints wonderfully. He paints amazingly. He, he beats me. Um, so it's all in your style. It's all in what you do. But loading and unloading the brush doesn't take a huge documentary. It's just control. It's about control. And the thinner the paint, the less you put on your brush. That's it. But yeah, I'm doing a well palette really to me. Um, I prefer it because I have control. Uh, I know exactly what my paint consistency should look like. Um, you know, I, at this point, I, I just kind of guesstimate how many drops of anything I'm putting in. Cause I just kind of know what it is by looking at it. Let's see. We're going to make a couple of nice long spaces. So to get NMM. Oh, sure. Yes, I will. Vithyel. I'm going to do more red. We're going to do a ton of red. Cause I was really happy with how the red was turning out on, uh, Miss Targaryen yesterday. So I want to get it all pounded out. So I'll see you there. So now what we're doing is uh, spacing out highlights. So I used to do like almost like just one, like it would, it would like have a highlight and then it would go down to a shadow and then I bring up the tip maybe. But when you really go and look at swords places where they're in real, real, uh, real surroundings, what you see is you see several shadows of, um, often breaking up a blade just because of everything that's around. So it looks a little bit more stylistic, but also it, it looks a little more real in a weird way when you do a couple of these little shinies coming down the blade. You could also just do one big shiny kind of in the middle bottom of the, of the blade. Um, it's up to you. I learned this technique from Sergio. It looks really stunning. And so that's why a lot of people do it. Um, I do like how it looks. So now I do a couple of uh, highlighted areas running down my blade. Because we could say that this is sky reflection here, but then maybe there's some bounce light here down on the ground um, that's coming from like buildings or shiny things around her. Could it be even coming from, you know, if she was posed a little different, like over here, this, this light could be coming directly from the leg, you know, stuff like that. So we're not looking for extreme realism here as we seldom are at 28 millimeter. We're mostly looking for what looks good. So I mostly want my blue focus toward the top of the blade if I'm working under that supposition. And I'm using a mixture of wet blending and layering to just kind of block these in. And then I'll uh, probably blend because um, layering white is such a pain in the butt. The easy way around it is to just layer with your, uh, your blue gray, your blue and gray. So instead of bothering to blend in this white by thinning it down, just uh, go back at it from the reverse direction with your uh, ashen blue and uh, cloudy gray and blend it in that way. And if you need to, you can pick up a little bit of white to kind of wet blend if you need to kind of fudge an area. I do a lot of spot wet blending if I get impatient or I'm working fast on stream. Um, or if it's a color that's difficult to layer, I often will do that. That's cool. Um, and, and it can work. Uh, it's just, you're always having the same surroundings. So I think it, it helps to have, to take pictures of your sword and dagger in different surroundings outside, different environmental conditions in the shade, in the sun, on a cloudy day, on a sunny day and a partly sunny day. So we're looking a little bit closer to it is here, although I even uh, put in a little bit of more dark, almost like it's a partly cloudy day where she is. So I can do that by mixing a little bit of my carbon into my uh, ashen blue. Hold on, let me grab that to get something a little darker. I'm just bringing that gray down just a little bit, maybe get bringing it down quite a bit up top. Because right under this hilt, it'll have a little bit of shadow probably. Let 
Yeah, I find that that mail is very easy with NMM, but you never want to get too engrossed in um, being precise about it. It's a very easy NMM to do. Now, when we go over to this other side, you want to alternate a little bit. Um, and if you ever do a really big sword and you're doing a lot of interrupted light on a blade and it's like 54 millimeter or bigger, I wonder if I have Sergio's. Let me, let me, uh, let me grab that. Hold on guys. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. It's not a Reaper model. Just hold on. Um, but I want to kind of demonstrate this because as you scale up with this technique, you do want to do some specific things to make it look better. Let me grab my Sergio sword. We're not going anywhere. You can settle. We're not going anywhere, little dog. We're not. I'm just getting my thing. She's like, but you got up, mama. It's okay. You could go back to sleep. Snooze. I'm hitting snooze on Kiri. Boop. All right. So when you're doing a much larger sword, key here is to make your areas of light and shadow different sizes. So on a little blade, not so, not so important. Not really not so important. Um, but uh, the bigger you get to get realistic, you want to do like, you can see how this area of highlight is much smaller than this area. And likewise, we've got several bands of light over here, a very solid light up top, very solid, you know, bigger light here. Your shadow areas are different sizes. They're different depths. You can definitely tell which area is in, is reflecting the most light from the environment and which area is uh, reflect, you know, having the most shadow, a lot, a lot of dark areas just because of what's around it. Um, so that's when you get bigger, then definitely mess up, um, the sizes of your highlights and shadows. That's just gonna, and this is base. Now what you would do over the top of this is you would then glaze colors in for the surroundings. So like he's in a jungle area. And so I would put, a, I would glaze probably a lot of greens, um, into like the lower part of this side. I'm, and down here, I would be glazing in this kind of greenish brownish tan that I've got built up you know, to have that reflection coming that way. So, and over here, once I got the colors in on his uh, olive green, swamp green, by the way, um, <laughs> pants, um, and, and the brown, if I take the brown up to a tiger, I haven't decided if it's going to be tiger skin or not, uh, in this orange here, like that would have little bits of color in here. So, so if you need to paint a cat, Corinico, you have an excellent reference. But that, when you when you scale up on blades, but look at what we're doing though. We're doing the same thing, right? We're doing white edging down one side, the other side, and down the middle. So the same technique here. This is just simplified because it's so small. Simpler, smaller equals simpler to get your result. Keep it simple. If you want to go crazy with textures and highlighting and insane, insane stuff everywhere, save it for big minis. So it's a reason to go. The reason to paint big is uh, is so that you have more room to play. You don't have cats on hand. Well, then you're going to have a problem. Well, I guess you'll have to just turn to Wikipedia and YouTube for cat references. Happily for you, cats do rule the internet. So uh, should you need to paint one, I am fairly certain you will be able to find a good reference. I personally do not have a cat currently either. All I have is a Kiri. So I have a good Kiri reference. All right, so let's get some shadow on the other side of this now. Um, that was the science fiction uh, mecha company, or um, I forget it was Cal. It was Cal. I M E F. It was a Cal abbreviation, Twistedoma. And they wanted me to trademark, um, you know, Reaper IP, so that's why we did I M E F Olive. Like, I want to do an olive green that was a military green, so we used the name of uh, Reaper Invented Military Corps for Cab, I think. All right, so when I go on the shadow over here, for contrast again, I'm going to be doing a bit of shadow down the offside of this blade, just right up against the white. Because remember, that's going to make it look shiny. Making sure we're good. And I'm just really going to paint that down. And it doesn't matter. I mean, if you blorf, blorf on the side away from the white highlight. But if you blorf a little bit over this edge, that's fine. Remember, you can just use the edge of your brush to bring your white back in. So I'm going to start out with a consistent band of shadow. 
because I want that shiny effect and just putting that shadow in has made the blade look shinier. But now we want bands of shadow like we have over here. So I will, I usually um, kind of make them off center a bit from the white. Like I'll make them kind of near the white bands, but I may put them a little lower um, or a little higher. Here I think we're going to go lower. And that's why you want that dark band down the entirety of the blade, the really thin dark band is so that if your really dark blobs don't line up being on the opposing side of your really light blobs perfectly, you still get the shiny effect because dark next to light, that's the way it works. Now, should I decide what color to paint her cobblestones, um, I will definitely put some reflected light uh, on the bottom part of this blade with that color. Like if I decide to go redstone, our favorite canceled color, not our, one of our favorite canceled colors, um, and make kind of a brick, uh, cobblestone, a red brick cobblestone, I would definitely put some of that color just in a glaze over the bit of the swords that are pointing down. Yeah, probably Nomadsy. I don't know. I forget what it was. I was never big in the cav. Alright, I need to fix that. Got a little bit Now remember, you still do have light on the off side of the blade. It's just not as strong as the light on the one side of the blade. You don't bring it up as high. And you don't use the blue. You might use brown or whatever earth color is around. I wouldn't go too crazy. You don't want your whole blade to look technicolor, but putting a hint in is fine. You mostly want that hint to be somewhere where it's very obviously related to the surface though. So usually down lower with this sword that's being held perpendicularly like this. I want to make sure that my bottom edge is pretty strong. Shiny, 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 yay, shiny. Sweet. All right, cool. I do feel like my carbon got uh, maybe dilu uh, diluted a little bit too much. So I might need to bring that back with a drop of carbon gray. I want it to be transparent, but I need it to be thick enough to be useful. Alrighty. Let's get our brown liner. Kind of outline some things. Like those little uh, clasps on the side of the boots. I'm not going to make a decision yet about the color of those clasps because I want to put my yellow in. Remember, we're going to have yellow on piping on the sleeves and stuff and on the pants. Um, so I want to first see how that yellow turns out and uh, make the judgment call of whether I need um, NMM gold down here to kind of echo that some of the color of the yellow. So right now, we're just going to put a dark shadow to outline these little clasps. And since we haven't painted them at all, we can be a little um, inexact about it. So we can be kind of messy. No problem. You do want to come up and uh, definitely differentiate them from sword blade here. So we got to paint the back of these at some point. Here. All right. This is also where you can touch up if your gray got out of control and you need to sharpen up some of these leg plates. Um, I want to come over here and shade around those little clasp things on this side. 
Looks like each little class of thing has an inner and outer part. So they're like circles with an inner circle. Sometimes when you're looking at something and you're not sure how it works, just kind of figure out what the shape is. Like these are a circle, they're discs and they've got an edge and then they've got an interior part. And that's really all you need to know because then you can paint them appropriately when the time comes. So right now I might do a little shadow to just bring out the fact that there is an edge there. Back here they're pretty set. That's pretty good. Uh, all right, so now we'll go up. Our leg looks good. It matches the other leg. We are progressing. Oh, and I blorked on my uh, happy little blade over here. Never panic. Just fix it. It's annoying when you do it, but we all do it. We all blorf. That was when I was lining there. And if it's a dark color on a light surface, the easiest way to deal with it is just to paint white over it. White is your highest coverage color, so it's going to cover over a blorf the fastest. And then you can just get to restoring your paint. Ta-da. Done. And that was a truly accidental blorf because I couldn't even see what I was doing because I was painting in the back and it accidentally impacted the front. Which is why you just don't freak out about it. So little plates like these are very simple and you shouldn't overthink them. Figure out what direction the light is coming from more strongly, which I think is this side because of the way I've painted this so far. And uh, might want to do a slightly higher highlight on that side. You aren't going to be able to show a lot on tiny plates like this, so don't overthink them. Just do your highlight, do your shadow, get back on it. It has been for all week, from what I'm hearing, Nomad. Twitch has been very twitchy all week. All right, so come in with your shadow. I'm choosing to treat these kind of like they've got a scallop, like they've kind of got a bend in the middle. Otherwise, they're very flat, and it would be difficult to figure out how to paint them. But at this point, I'm going to do a little paint plastic surgery and suggest that, because it makes sense with their shape, that that would be how they're shaped. So... And our dark side, we've got a dark side and a light side and an under reflection, an off reflection, just like we always do. So then we've got that. And see how fast it is when you do this, these little simple areas. It's very easy to suggest the metallic effect. Bringing up my white just a little more solid here. A bit of white. Oh, nose. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, my feed says I'm okay. Of course, we don't have a Justin to kind of check it. So I don't know how it is at Reaper. Yeah, who knows? All right, doing a little pinpoint highlight on the other side. Got your shadow. Pretty good. All right, we got that there. We don't have this arm yet. We haven't done this arm yet. Let's look it up on that, what I did. This is a very difficult plate to do. Although this plate itself is what decided me that I want to do these in metal and not in uh, leather because this, this sort of plate would just be like weird in boiled leather, I think. I, am gonna, I decided I am going to paint a version of this as a, as a rogue in leather um, and do this all in leather. It's going to be a bit easier. Uh, but um, let's see here. We need our highlight. Highlight. 
we need to figure out our highlight on these guys. Highlight, 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 highlight on the edge. Ooh, we're out of focus. There we go. Got too close. When your home internet is lagging, it gives you the 2000 error. That's good to know, Reaper John. Right, I think he's saying when his internet is lagging, it gives him the 2000. So I don't know. I don't know what your internet's like. Twisted. Do you have really good internet? Just blocking in some highlight. Uh, I think the highlight needs to go up here. Another highlight up here. Highlight, highlight. Lots of highlights. Kind of figuring out. And I'm just blobbing them in. Because I want to kind of check their positioning. Yeah, who knows, right? I mean, it's different browsers. Everybody's on different browsers and different um, types of devices. And this can just be a little bit weird, a little twitchy. I'm sorry for those of you who are getting booted off. Hmm, I need to lower that. So right away, like when I look at stuff like this, I'm like, okay, my two patches of highlight are too close together. I'm going to have to fix that. It will not work. Do -do -do. Right, right. Yeah, I get it, Stephanie. Yeah, it's hard to say, right? Doing a shadow up there. Remember, right between your highlights, you got a shadow. And you kind of want to keep it in line. Make sure it's consistent the way the shadow comes down the arm because the light is going to be hitting at the same angle all the way down the arm. So I blocked in highlights first, then I blocked in shadows. So I could just kind of adjust from there. You want to get something down. Like this is like, consider the blobbiness a rough draft. And give yourself permission to make a crappy rough draft. <laughs> as we say in the writing, in the writing game. Uh, so give yourself permission to make some crappy blocked in colors. Then refine. Use thinner paint and start blending. But what this does is it lets you kind of eyeball um, just plain twitch. Better thing. Yeah. See, that's what I'm hearing from a bunch of streamers is, is every different streamer is having this problem, which is makes me happy because at least I know it's not on my end. Um, I thin my base coat a bit, Herkalurka. It depends actually on what I'm working on. Like if I'm working on a... Um, uh, do I have a bones model? Yeah. So if I'm working on a Reaper bones model and those are plastic and they're like PVC, so they're bendy. See how bendy? Um, I won't, uh, I use my base coat at that point almost full strength. I probably thin it just a little bit. But in order to paint on Reaper bones, you really want to wash the miniature first if you're going to put the paint on. Um, I don't use a primer. I just paint straight on the figure with Reaper bones. So I wash them first in, in uh, hot water with a bit of dish soap let them dry, rinse and let them dry off overnight. And then I find I can base coat them with my usual base coat, which is about five drops of paint to one drop of water. It varies, right? If it's a metal model like she is, and I've primed her, then I use a thin base coat, usually four to one, a little bit thinner, four to one paint to water. And now that I'm highlighting, because um, everything's already, you know, based at least, now I'm using mixtures, and it really depends on um, whether I'm what. It depends on the color because every color is going to have different coverage, right? So white is going to have a lot stronger coverage uh, and be harder to blend than some of these other more transparent colors, like my cloudy gray. Um, so uh, these vary in thicknesses, 
this uh, white that I've been layering with is like close to is, is uh, like a 2.5 water to paint. So it's actually got a ton of water in it. Uh, it's probably been drying out, so I need to add a little more. Um, but that's because I'm trying to do some smooth blends with it as I do these highlights. But my thicker white here is probably about 2 to 1 or 1 to 1 paint to water. Um, and I'm using that just for blocking in some of these highlights. So I I work with thin paint exclusively after my initial layer. And even my base coat is a little thin, but not very much. Also, hello and nice to meet you. I'm glad you I'm glad you found me. I do uh, I do a Morning Street perk um, on here on Reaper, uh, 11.30 a.m. USA Central Time until 1 p.m. USA Central Time every weekday. And then uh, I have my own channel as well, twitch.tv slash painting big, where I do my own personal stuff. Um, and uh, we stream on art on Tuesday and Wednesday. And we're going to, we've are going we just started streaming on the D&D channel on Thursday, painting D&D characters and kind of doing some world building for, uh, for the world they live in. Um, We'll be making up their personalities, and you know, we picked uh, picked some models and character classes, and it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'm gonna paint some villains too, and maybe we'll do some um, some kind of online like group role play after we world build or during our world building or something like that. I don't know. It's all a brave new world on Thursday on my channel, so we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do. But we're gonna have fun no matter what. I've had, I've been having a ton of fun world building with everybody because I love world building and making characters is the best part anyway. So. I've been having a lot of fun there. Looking forward to this week's Thursday Thursday stream. All right, so blocking in more white there. Probably a little bit too much, but this arm is, remember, I've decided the light is stronger on this side, so I can go a little lighter on my highlights. Um, my channel is uh, twitch.tv slash painting big, just like my Patreon is patreon.com slash painting big. I am painting big everywhere, except here. <laughs> well, and even here for my starting soon screen, I've got my logo up. So, uh, so yeah, that is my, my stuff. And I'm also painting big on Instagram. Although I have been, I've put up a couple of newer things. I've been a little lax posting on Instagram. I keep trying to remind myself, but I'm uh, much happier putting more time into my Patreon and Twitch than on social media. So yeah, it is what it is. Oh, yeah, it won't, it won't let you link straight Shadow Raven. You've got to put spaces between the, um, the dots or slashes. It is silly that way. They don't want people dropping a bunch of links and they want to um, discourage uh, link spammers. So do a little bit of shadow here. A little bit of shadow there. Interrupting my highlight a little bit. I'm going to minimize this highlight. It's gotten a little fat. On small plates and areas like the arm, especially if they're not getting a lot of light, if they're on the side that's not getting more light, um, you want to minimize those highlights, make them really small and tight. I probably do need to make it a little lighter at the top, but we'll get there. That's good though. I like that. That's reading right, even though it's all blocky and it's not blended at all. <laughs> yeah, I do paint a lot of bigger things on my stream. But uh, right now we've been working on uh, um, some Dark Sword commission models that I'm working on, which are pretty cool. They're the Targaryens from uh, Song of Ice and Fire, although they're the precursor Targaryens, prelude to Song of Ice and Fire. So there's Aegon the Conqueror, the first Targaryen who uh, tromped around in Westeros, who brought a dragon to a gunfight, to a sword fight, essentially. Uh, he and his sister queens are the models I'm painting. So we'll do those again today, and then D and D stream is Thursday. Hello, Cujo. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm doing it on my Twitch.tv slash painting big. Garrett. So my stream, uh, we're on Tuesday, Wednesday, we're going to continue doing art streams with miniatures, um, usually my commission work or my competition pieces. And then on Thursday, that stream will go and be on the D&D channel and we'll do uh, character models, villains and stuff for our new world. And I did start a, a World Anvil account and I actually started writing kind of a summary of stuff that we'd been doing and I'm waiting for uh, Pendrake to post up his notes to make sure I didn't uh, miss anything. Because I gave Pendrick access to our Discord so that he could uh, post up his notes about what we've what we've got so far on the game, 
that way we can we can decide we don't we're not bound in steel right if we decide something about the game or the world and then later we come back and go you know what this isn't working uh, we can always adjust it but i like to have the notes of the stuff that we talked about on our game so i thought pendrake pendrake gets special permission to come in and post notes on our our discord please welcome him Uh, you know what? I lost some gray there. I want to. Uh... There. But yeah, once I've got a little bit more material up on my World Anvil, guys, I'll, I'll uh, post the link in the Discord and uh, on the Twitch probably even. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no jokes, Ryan I, right? But yeah, so... I decided that I was lonely and wanted a D&D game, and since I just moved out here six months ago, exactly six months ago, uh, to the day, um, you know, with COVID and everything, it's just, I haven't found a game, and I was like, you know what, this could be super fun. This could be super fun to do it on Twitch with everybody. It uh, satisfies my, um, my, my role-playing game bug. And I honestly think it might be even more fun than a normal role-playing game. I brought this up before, but I kind of am basing this idea around a game called 13th Age, which was created by the lead designer of 4th Edition and the lead designer, one of the lead designers of 3.5, um, who went on to do their own thing. And 13th Age kind of is a cooperative world building where the GM gives you the basics, but then a lot of the particulars are created by the players as long as with, with GM blessing, pretty much, you know, the GM has to kind of like, okay, cool. Um, but uh, it's a cooperative world build at that point. The details are all... If the players are proactive and want to, the details can be all ironed out by them. And then it makes it a fun where everybody who's playing in the world is also building the world. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with that Thursday stream. Is uh, create a fun world with all of you. And then create characters in it. Do some role playing. We'll see how it scales up. Depending. Right now, it's very easy because, uh, you know, we don't get a ton of viewers, so uh, it's really easy. Chat is very easy to read. You know, we'll see if it um, gets a little bit unwieldy as we, uh, if we grow. But right now, I think it'll work great. I think we'd have to get to serious, like, crazy levels of viewership before it would become where you couldn't read chat. Great, Herga. Because, like, when I watch my Overwatch streamers, um, usually even if they've got several hundred people on, it's not, the chat is not unreadable. Um, it's only when they get, like, over a thousand and people are spamming stuff that chat becomes unreadable. So, we shall see. We'll see how it goes. Now I'm just adjusting. I'm just generally going over the whole thing. Kind of adjusting shadows and highlights, doing blending, making sure I've got under-reflections popped in here. Because remember... Um, you've got your main source of light and you've got your shadow, which you need for the shiny factor, but then you also need your under reflection to show that light is bouncing back up at the underside of these metal plates so that they convincingly look metal. So you're getting that. This is maybe a little broad compared to the other side, but the arms are at different angles and the armor is a little bit, uh, different i've got definitely more plates facing frontal in this and this i see the sleeve a little bit more so we got to kind of adjust for that but yeah once i have blocks in where i'm like okay all of my highlights and shadows are blocked in now my challenge is to look at each piece and see if it looks metallic try to kind of sh troubleshoot um thank you reaper john thank you for the the proper link Thank you. All right. 
Yeah, that's a, this is coming along. It's not bad. I think I do need to lighten up the top a little bit. I think I've got a little, well, that shadow, I guess, isn't too bad. Probably need a little more up top, though. So if you remember from that thing we were talking about a while ago, that TED Talk on how to learn anything, how to be good at anything in like 20 hours, and the first thing was deconstruct it, right? So we're deconstructing it by saying, okay, you know, highlight plus shadow equals shiny plus under reflection means reflective, and that's metal. So we're deconstructing that, and we're deconstructing how to get smooth layers. But then our next thing is uh, learn enough to self-correct. In other words, learn enough to troubleshoot. And that's what we're exercising right now. So having broken down our skill, we've done, you know, blocked things in, in line with what we've broken down, but now we need to look at it and self-correct. We need to assess whether anything looks wrong. Um, so that's the second step of getting good is to learn enough to know when it doesn't look right and learn enough to know how to correct it. If you can identify why it looks wrong, you should be able to correct it. So it's not just the what and how to do the what, it's then why. And uh, remember the third part of that formula of how to get good in 20 hours is to clear obstacles to practice. So this means stop making excuses. It means if you want to get better at mini painting, get butt in chair. Um, if you notice that you're self-sabotaging, like, oh, but I just want to sit in my comfy chair a little bit, you know, after dinner, and then you end up watching three hours of TV, um, you know, stop self-sabotaging. Be conscious of it. So remove the barriers to practice. If you find that you just don't want to sit down and paint because your area is always a mess, clean it up, you know, remove the barrier to practice. If you are, you know, maybe wanting to paint in the evening, but you find that you're wasting a lot of time on something, maybe uh, learn how to get more efficient at whatever is wasting your time so that you can finish your task or move it to a different part of your day and make more time to paint. Things like that. Yeah, exactly, Turkalurka. That's exactly it. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, it's hard sometimes, you know, right? We get in this happy little comfort zones. We get to like our little rituals, but then we feel sad because we aren't, you know, we aren't getting, we want to get better at mini painting, but then we feel like we have no time. And a lot of the time it, it is a self-sabotage thing, especially when you're learn, first learning a new thing and you know you're not going to be good at it. You know you're going to fail. And you're just like, oh, do I even want to go there? But that's part of it. That's, that is never, failing is never a wasted opportunity. It's like, it's an opportunity to like learn more and then you come back at it and you know a little bit more about how to troubleshoot that thing. You know what doesn't work, right? And that's, that's useful. It's worthwhile. But yeah, I do a lot of, I, I constantly am looking at myself about self-sabotage. Like, uh. If I sit around and I spend too much time cleaning up after dinner, I won't walk in the evening, right? So I've had to really kind of watchdog myself and go, no, I can clean up a couple of things, but then I have to go walk. Even if I'm leaving dishes for David, if he doesn't want to do them, he'll just leave them for me and I can do it when I come back. Um, so sometimes it's just like, you know, my little, I don't want to walk self saying, oh, I can, I can help clean up the dishes and feel useful. And then I have an excuse not to walk. And it's like, no, there should never be an excuse not to walk. So yeah, I do the same thing. I have to stay vigilant on myself a lot. Same with um, after lunch. Like after lunch is uh, really a great time for me to get work done on PDFs and stuff. So that's what I've been trying to do. Um, but I have to really watch myself because it's so easy to get sucked into other things instead of sitting down and working because it's like the lunch hour. It's like I had to force myself to end the lunch hour and open my PDFs, right? Because I always have to be working on 
I've, I've got constantly got writing to do between the Patreon and, and coachings and stuff. So it's all you got to be kind of a little bit self-aware, self-aware of how you trap yourself. Otherwise we get sad and then we just want to avoid all of it because we feel so bad about it. And that's, that's a sad thing. Hitting that ankle. I mean, lazy weekends, you got to detox, right? You got to give yourself time to detox. But so there are times when I really just need to sit and stare into space a little bit or take a walk and just stare into space while I'm walking. But uh, I find that paint is a good detox too, painting in general. If you can just relax and work on something you like. So that's an example of how thin paint can help you hit those tiny little details that little fastener yeah that's cool Karinko. yeah everybody's got different different kind of uh, biorhythm schedule going on i uh i find it very hard to make time in my morning for exercise but i almost always can make time either lately since it's getting dark uh, my evening walks aren't going to fly as well so um because i don't like walking in the dark so uh I'm starting to transition to doing workout right after lunch. And then uh, it energizes me for the afternoon, which is really nice. But yeah, it's part of kind of figuring out what works for you, right? Like when, try a couple different things and see what works best. And for me, I have very much a seasonal shift. Because I really enjoy walking in the evening. Because I tend to have a lot of energy in the morning, so... I usually don't have time, I have trouble then, but if I, uh, otherwise I start to tank really fast in the late afternoon and evening, and so walking after supper, when it's light enough out, really helps me, or energize to get some other stuff done in the evening. Yeah, painting terrain is a great detox. So now, though, with winter coming, and I, I really don't, I mean, we live in, we live really close to downtown, so it's like there are people around if I walk in the evening, but... That's a plus and a minus with COVID. Um, I like my walk around the residential neighborhoods near here better. So I'm just going to have to go earlier in the day. Alrighty. We're about ready, at least on the front, to factor in some gold MM and the yellow. Uh, and then black leather. We're, we're to that point, guys. We look at this. We, uh, we got pretty much... Our NMM, our silver NMM is pretty much good. Like there's still little touches here and there, like darkening down a shadow here and there and here. But in general, in general, everything's reading kind of correct. This, this is too light here. Too light. So again, little bits of correct correction. Honestly, the best way to motivate yourself to paint is to make yourself sit down for two weeks at a specific time every day if you can and paint, even if you don't feel like it. What will happen then is that you will get in the habit and that every time you sit down at that time of day, you will feel like painting. I am not, uh, this is, this is not a joke. It really works. I learned, uh, I, I actually used this habit forming hack, life hack recently with my writing, the writing after lunch thing, to get myself in the mood to write every day at that time when I sit down. It also helps if you have a trigger. Like for people who use this life hack to help with their exercise routine, it's putting on their specific pair of shoes and then they just leave immediately. They don't let themselves like negotiate or doubt whether they're going to go. They just go, put on the shoes and go. That way, every time you put on that pair of shoes, you go, you feel like going. The brain, you have control over your brain. It is Your brain does not run you. You might have to, like, exert control for the first couple weeks to get that habit ingrained, but once you do, it works. It really does work. Yeah, yeah, I think she's looking pretty good, guys. I think that this NMM is uh, working out really well. And she's pretty much set. But yeah, motivation. 
motivation isn't going to come up and grab you by the scruff of the neck and haul you off to be, to be creative. You have to like, you know, self-motivate. And that sounds terrible, but it's, it's true. And it doesn't take that much. It just takes you being um, accountable with yourself. It helps also if you kind of do a mind game, like you imagine yourself painting. Like sometimes if I'm if I'm kind of having trouble sitting down to get a task done just because maybe it's a task I don't like very much or, you know, I just I just don't want to. <laughs> I it helps if I sit if I kind of let myself imagine myself sitting down and doing it, which sounds weird but it works. Because um, I'll imagine myself doing it, and I'll imagine myself getting it done and feeling good about it, and then I can sit down and do it a lot easier seems it seems more approachable especially if it's a huge task if it's a big task if the reason you've been avoiding it is that there's just so much of it in that case just chunk it down and imagine yourself doing it and how good you're going to feel when you get done with it all right i'm going to get back on camera here do a to-do list sit down make yourself do a to-do list for like 10 minutes, 20 minutes tops. Write down the things you most need to do. Only worry about them. Don't make your to-do list long. Do not make it, you know, huge, a huge um, spam down the page or it will have the opposite effect. It will make you feel overwhelmed. <laughs> but like put down the top three or four things you need to do. And when you do that, don't put down, you know, like need to contact mental health people. Put down, look up phone number to contact mental health people and write it down on this page. That is easy. That is a super easy step that takes maybe three minutes. And then you have the phone number. So the next day, your list can be, call mental health people at this phone number. And there you have chunked it down into much easier steps. All of these things, you can tell that I used to procrastinate a lot because I have all these life hacks that have helped me get past that stuff. I will share them with you. And so maybe some of them will work for you. Not, not everything works for everybody, but that one works for me. If I break it down into the next step, if it's something I'm looking, like I'm really not looking forward to, like the DMV or, you know, things like that, it'd be like, you know, like yesterday my list was look on DMV for a list of forms I need to uh, get my car registered. So I looked at it and I found the page for it and now I have that page up and the next list of, you know, the next list of things is check form, you know, first three forms to see if I really need them, you know, stuff like that. And that way... Like, it might take me a week or a week and a half, but I'll get to the point where I have all the forms I need all filled out and I'm ready to make an appointment with the DMV. Whereas if I didn't do that, it would be a month. <laughs> you know, I'll still, I'd sit there for a month going, oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to do this. So at least with my brain, I found it, I really need to break it down into tiny steps. And part of that may also be that I have a lot going on at any given time. I don't know. I think that that's in like one, you shouldn't ever be hitting white wife overhead with a shovel Val, but you should definitely be, um, you know, if you are going to, you should not be telegraphing it by digging the hole. I know that, you know, most organizational guides would have you dig the hole first, but I have to, uh, in this case, disagree. However, I disagree with you hitting your wife over the head with a shovel period. If you don't like your wife, get a divorce. <laughs> this is me, though. I got a divorce. Uh, murder is never the answer. There. Let's go there. Let's go more, more politically correct. And it wasn't even... But, uh, yeah. Don't... That's another one. We can talk about that one, too. We can talk about that one all day. Don't blame the other people in your life for why you're not getting stuff done. If you looked at those people and you went, no, I'm going to sit down and do this because it needs to get done, those people would back off and go, whoa, dude, I, I didn't mean to, you know, whatever. You know, it, don't blame other people. Take responsibility for yourself. Like, there's such a lack of accountability sometimes in our lives these days. It's very easy to blame everything else. But I've kind of learned that I feel a little happier when I admit that it's just me kind of being a putting things off and not trying to 
reach for somebody else. There we go. Get our back going on. Good deal. Yeah, Nightmare Black. See? Awesome color. Not on the canceled list. Alrighty. I think I want to line these guys and get that blocked in. I've just decided that I may as well hit all of the NMM I can in the time. Oh, wow. It's quarter after 11 already. We've gone over. <laughs> I got in the groove with my NMMs and I totally uh, went over time. And Kiri's like, yeah, Mama, it's time to take me outside. She's got that, fade, that look on her face. All right. Well, then. Uh, we need to raid, so I need to text Justin, unless he's there with you, John. I'll tell uh, tell him time to raid, because he said he was going to set up a raid for us. Hopefully he can chat, uh, he can type in chat, um, and let us know who we're going to raid. Or it'll be a surprise. It could be a surprise. There we go. I've texted the Justin. All right, so hopefully you guys learned some stuff today. Yeah, well, especially when you're in the groove, right? When you get in the zone, you just go. And uh, and zoomies. Zoomies happen. Um, so we zoomied through our uh, NMMs. And yeah, she's looking good. Now I need to block in the yellow and the gold NMM. Once we block that in with a base coat, it's going to look so much closer to done. And then we're going to uh, have to make some decisions about our groundwork and what we're going to do with our, uh, our cobblestones, right? Or our, our curb, as it were. Auto zone. Up oh, there we go. We're raiding just Isis. Justin has come through for us, and we are queuing up for that raid. Thank you all for coming out today. I had a good time, and I hope you learned stuff about the NMMs and uh, and about life hacking <laughs> and uh, various other stuff. And I'll see some of you this afternoon on my stream at around uh, four thirty p.m. Uh, Central USA time. All right. Have a good one, guys. See you later.